Lecture 14. Today I'm going to take just a couple of seconds at the start here to talk about colors and images. It's a minor little topic, just a bookkeeping thing. And then we're going to talk about the main thing for today, which is multi-threaded programming. And we're going to revisit a little bit about error handling. We've already learned a little bit about that, but now we're going to learn some more. And this multi-threaded programming thing is just all about making sure our apps are responsive, not getting blocked and stuck and having these where it hangs for a second. That's a terrible experience for a user. So we got to learn how to do this to prevent that. All right, color. Now you guys already know about the color struct. It's a pretty cool struct because it implements a lot of different protocols. It can be used to specify a color like foreground color, color.green. That means make that color green. But it also, as we saw, can be a shape style. So I can say fill of a color and it builds it like a gradient or other shape styles. And it can even act like a view. I'm not sure if I did this ever, but you can just say color.white. Actually, did we do that maybe in emoji art? But you can just say color.white, and that means a rectangle filled with white because color also implements the view protocol. But when it comes to actually representing a color, that's a bit of a tricky thing in general in the world, not just in Swift. Because when you say that you have a color and it's a certain shade of pink, well, if you're an ad agency and you're trying to get an emotional reaction out of people with that exact shade of pink, well, you want it when it hits the video to be exactly that shade of pink. And so there are a lot of mechanisms for specifying colors very, very specifically and accurately. And the color struct is really, that's not the business it's in. There's another little thing called UI color, and that's what we use to actually represent colors. And it knows how to create colors in different color spaces like RGB, red, green, blue, and also HSB, hue, saturation, and brightness, uh, and others. And it, it's how you would kind of store a color or represent a color is UI color. So if you see UI color, that's all it is. It's just a representation of a color. And you can easily create a color struct up above from a UI color by just saying color, UI color as the argument and, and create it there. But I just wanted to make sure you understood because you're going to see both in code that you write and in examples. I'm like, well, what's the difference between a color and UI color? That's the difference. There's also another one called CG color. Of course, we know CG is short for core graphics, CG rect, CG size, CG point, all that stuff we've been seeing when we draw. So there's also CG color, which is the base level representation of a color in the core graphic system. You might see that. You can maybe get a CG color from a color struct with CG color, although it returns an optional. So you could get possibly get back nil in certain circumstances. Anyway, you're, you're only gonna see CG color one out of a thousand times you go see a color. So don't worry too much about that one. Now images have a similar kind of uh, duality of existence here. We know all about the image struct. We use it to put images on screen. We've been doing, especially with that system name thing, but you can also put images, JPEG images or whatever in your assets. I showed you this on the very first day of class. There's this little XE assets thing. You can drag them in there and give them names and you can get them out of there with image of that name. And it goes and looks the name up inside your XE assets. And that assets over there lets you specify things like this resolution of this thing and all kinds of stuff. So you can control the images pretty well doing that. And you also know about the system name and things like the image scale, which is like relatively scaling the system images relative to the font. And we know that if we apply the dot font modifier to an image, it's going to scale the system image to match the font. And system images have another little use. We see it a lot, which is using them as masks. So like the little tabs at the bottom of a tab view, right? It looks kind of like a inverted image or whatever. Uh, that it gets colorized by use, being used as a mask and a color gets kind of filtered through the, it, for example. So you'll see system images used as masks. Now, image is not though the way you would represent an actual image. If you wanted to have an image in your hand, you would use UI image. UI image is, is the thing, for example, that can take a bunch of JPEG data and turn it into an image. So if you had a bunch of JPEG data in a file or we dragged and dropped it into emoji art or whatever, and we wanna put an image on screen of it, we would have to turn it into a UI image first. And that's what async image does, because you pass async image 
that view a URL, it goes and turns it into a UI image and then uses it. Now we're going to do our own async image today. And you're gonna see that when we go out to the internet to get our background image, we're gonna turn it into a UI image first. That's how we'll hold on to it. And then when we wanna display it, we'll pass it to an image. Right, that's it, that's a minor little thing. Multi-threaded programming, not a minor little thing. <laughs> Why do we bring this up? Well, we do not want to block our UI. To say that that's important is a dramatic understatement. All of you, I'm sure, you've used an app where you touched on something or you tried to swipe and it's like, it's stuck. And then a second or two later, oh, it frees up and it moves. Nothing more annoying for users than that. They will just stop using apps that do that. So we gotta figure out some way to never have that happen, even though sometimes we do things that take a long time. What kind of things cause this problem? Well. Anything that is gonna access the network, it's definitely gonna be something we're gonna to have to do multi-threaded programming for. Every time we go out to the network to get a background image or something, it could take 10 seconds. It could take a minute, okay? And we can't have your app blocked for a minute, so that's clear. But even some very CPU intensive things you might do. Maybe you're doing some machine learning thing, all right? And you're feeding it a lot of data and training it or something, or you're sending it something and having it crunch on it to see what it thinks it is. Uh, though that could take a long time. That you can't do blocking the UI either. So we need threads to deal with these things. That is our solution, threads of execution. Now, raise your hand if you've done, seen or kind of been exposed to any kind of system that does threads. Uh, not quite, almost all of you, but not quite. So uh, hopefully this will still make sense to you if you haven't seen it. And if you have seen it, probably, possibly you've only barely seen it. Hopefully this will makes sense and you're gonna get some really good news on the end of this next slide. So let's talk about threads and uh, Swift and iOS in general. Most modern operating systems have threads, okay? Most devices, modern devices are multi-core. So even if they're not multi-processor, they've got multiple cores in there that could be running multiple things literally at the same time, okay? Two different threads of execution. Now, from our perspective as programmers, when we're programming with threads, what it looks like is different pieces of code in our app are running at the same time. That's what it seems like. That may not actually be true because you can have multi-threading on a system that's single core, single processor. And what's happening there is that the OS is quickly swapping between them, giving a few cycles to this one, a little cycle to this one, and they seem to be running at the same time. Um, so it's not exactly that. But from our perspective, it just looks like, two pieces of code or 10 pieces of code all running simultaneously. Now in Swift, all these threads are managed behind the scenes. Whew, you do not have to create threads or any of that. But the system does need a little help from us, a little bit of hints of when it can go put something on another thread, right? When something takes a long time and maybe should run another thread because it's a network call or whatever. So we're gonna talk about the API, the key words in the Swift language that we use to help it understand when to use threads. But it's gonna do all the thread management for us, which is one of the really cool things about Swift. So here's the first thing, this one's gonna make the most sense to you, which is what if you have something that's gonna take a long time and you just don't wanna be done on the main thread where the UI is running. You can just create one of these objects called a task it has an argument priority, which is how important is this task? Should I give it a lot of cycles, right? Or should it not be that important? And by the way, the UI as a kind of task is very important. In fact, it's almost impossible to create a task with this that's more important than the UI. And all you do is create this task and you give it a closure and whatever code's in that closure is gonna be run on some other thread. Now you don't know which thread, anything about, all you know is the priority you've given it, but it's up to the system to go manage all the threads. All you've said is, here's a closure, please go run that. Now notice you get a little return thing there, this little task. When I say this line of code, it returns immediately. The system grabs that closure and it kind of puts it in its little queue of things to do to go run it on another thread. But this returns instantly. And the thing it returns, that green thing, is just a little blob that lets you cancel the task. If you're like, eh, I don't really want it anymore. You can yield to that task. If you have other tasks going on that might depend on it, you can sleep. Uh, if this closure returns a value, you could basically block and wait for that to return, which kind of defeats the purpose of forking it off on another thread, but you could do it. The incredible thing about this is we almost never do this. 
let task equal, we just say task do it. We fork off a task and we just let it run. It's rare that we want to cancel a task, we might. And by the way, even canceling doesn't kill the task. It really just kind of sets a flag that the task, the little closure can look at and say, oh, I've been canceled. I better stop doing this and just return. That's really all cancellation is. So we don't really do let task equal very often. We usually just say task, curly braces, boom. And as instant you say that, returns immediately, puts that closure on a queue to go run on other threads. So this is simple multi-threading. Everyone understand this piece of it right here. Notice that when you do this, put a closure in tasks like there, you're basically telling the system, hey, I'm going to do something that might take a long time. <laughs> maybe it's going to access the network and can get blocked, or maybe it's a machine learning thing, like I said. And so the system knows that it's going to go off and use threads and make this be in parallel. This is the simplest basic multitasking, uh, multi-threading thing going on here. Now, this is not quite enough. This would sound like, oh, this is fine. But there's a humongous problem with multi-threaded programming. And any of you who have actually done it know what the problem is. The problem is access to data structures. You got multiple pieces of code all running at the same time. If they're all banging on the same data structure, that data structure gets absolutely mangled. You have an array and you're adding things to the array, you're moving things from the array, and maybe even doing that is not atomic. So it's like you get halfway through adding something and someone else comes in to, to remove something from the array. It's a mess. So how do we manage shared access to data structures. Well, this is all, again, kind of managed for us by Swift and Swift syntax, but we have to help it out. We have to give it an idea how we do that. And we do that with a type I didn't even mention when I talked about the Swift type system. Remember when I talked about classes and structs and enums and functions? These were all types in the Swift type system. Well, I sneakily didn't mention this one, an actor. Actor is declared just like a class or a struct, you say actor, name of the thing, it implements certain protocols, it's kind of almost exactly the same. But the two big things to note about an actor type is that it's a reference type, like a class. In other words, it lives in the heap and you have a pointer to it. So a lot of people can be pointing to the same actor and sharing it. And the thing that an actor does that structs in class don't do is that it synchronizes all access to its vars and funks. So the actor is the fundamental unit of synchronization when we're trying to not smash all our data structures with these multi-threaded pieces of code. Now, if you're not writing any multi-threaded code yourself, you're not doing any of this machine learning thing in the background, blah, 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 or whatever, you're never gonna have to create your own actor. If all you're using multi-threading for is to keep your UI going fast and do other stuff off the UI, then there's the main actor, which we're going to talk about. The main actor is an actor that the system creates where all the UI stuff happens. And you just want to make sure that you're doing the right stuff on the main actor and the rest of the slow stuff off the main actor, right? So we're going to talk all about the main actor in a couple slides here. So let's talk about how actors work. Right? How do they do this synchronization? A couple of rules here. The first rule, and this one makes perfect sense, only one of the actor's functions or vars can be running at any one time. Now, there might be 100 threads assigned to run code for this actor, but only one of them can be running at the same time. So you never have a situation where two functions in the actor are running in two different threads at the same time. That is the fundamental unit of synchronization. You can see that solves the problem, right? Now, you might say, well, wait a second. Well, I don't even have asynchronous programming anymore. But you're going to see that we do. Because the second thing here is that a function in an actor either runs to completion or it can get suspended. And if it gets suspended, now other actor functions and bars can run and they'll run for a while. And then eventually you are gonna tell the system, okay, I'm, I'm ready to unsuspend. And it'll put you on the list to get back to you and have you running. Again, you're only gonna be continued after whatever other functions in the actor have run to completion or suspended, but you're gonna go back. And it's the suspension points that allow us to have an actor only running one thing at a time and still swapping between the various functions because they're getting suspended and now I can go run another one. And that one gets suspended, now I can go over and run this other one. So it's switching back and forth. But the fact that we're going back and forth and either running to completion or suspension means we never have to worry about smashing each other's data structures. When we get suspended, when we come back, we better be careful because other actor things might have run, but we never have to like, as we're running through our phone, oh no, something changed out from under us because we get to run to completion or suspension. 
Now I put suspended in purple because it's a very important part of making this all work. So the first thing is we have to let the system know when a function can suspend, okay? When it's possible for this function to be suspended. And we do that by marking it async. Just like we put throws on a function that can throw, we put async on a function that is, could be possibly suspended. And that's why we call these suspendable functions here, async functions. Functions that do things like access the network are almost always async. And I'm gonna show you one in the demo that's not, <laughs> that was not async and why we would never use it to access the network, even though it's capable of it. And I'll show you another version that is async. And the reason you wanna have your network access functions marked async is because when they go send off their HTTP request, they're gonna suspend themselves. And they're gonna wait until that request comes back. And then they're gonna say, okay, I'm ready to keep going. And then their actor will get back to them and let them run when there's time, because they might be running some other function at the time that you say you're done. Now, async is an advertisement that a suspension could happen, but it's not saying it will happen. So I could have a function it's marked async and it runs to completion, it never suspends, ever. It just doesn't even have it. Why would I ever have an async function that does that? Well, maybe it takes a long time to run. And so essentially what I'm saying to the rest of the world is, yeah, I might suspend, so you better watch out, but really I'm just gonna take a very long time. All right, so that's part one, is marking our functions async here. So the other rule here is that when you call an async function, you have to use the keyword await. Again, like when you call a function that throws, you have to say try. Well, when you call a function that's marked async, you have to say await, which await is a great word. It means you are awaiting that thing that could take a long time because it can suspend itself or it might just take a very long time. But anyway, you see what I'm saying? You are waiting for it, so I'm awaiting that, and that's why you have to mark it with a wait. Now, of course, marking it with a wait here is not for Swift. Swift knows you're calling an async function. It's for you in your code to note, oh yeah, I, I'm gonna possibly suspend here. And that's what a wait means, really. A wait means I could be suspended here. And the only way you can be suspended is by calling a function that's asynchronous. That is it, there's no other way to say, oh yeah, suspend here, please. You have to call a function that's asynchronous and be awaiting on it. That's when your actor knows, oh, you're suspended. I can go run some of my other ones. And then when that function you're waiting on finishes, that's when you say, okay, I'm done, I'm ready to go again. And then the actor, when it has time, it's gonna come back to you and let you continue. That's how this whole system works. That's all there is, <laughs> async functions and awaiting, and thus you can be suspended at those points. And this, they really did a good job of making it simple here. So there's not a lot of other keywords for saying you want to suspend yourself and all. This is it. This is all there is. The reason you want to have this await keyword to remind yourself is because when you get suspended, your actor might go off and change itself because the actor is then allowed to go run other functions on itself while you're suspended. So when you have a function wait, you need to look at the code in the rest of your function after the await and make sure there's not some assumptions you're making about your actor's data structures that might have been changed because other code in your actor runs. So maybe you have to check to make sure that array is in the state you thought. Now the good news is you come back from the await, you check the array to make sure it's the way you want, and now you get to run to completion. Because once you get resumed, you get to run to completion unless you have another suspension. Sometimes you'll go through your app and just search for await and go to every single one and say, am I sure that when I come back from this, the world's gonna be what I think? And you're gonna see in the demo today, there's actually a reason for us to do this. I made the demo exactly in this way. So you would say, oh, I see why I have to pay attention to my await when I could be suspended. And that's it, async and await, that's all there is in there. Now, if you have a function and you wanna do something that takes a long time, access the network or whatever, but you don't want to suspend, you do not wanna be suspended. Maybe you're the UI main actor and you wanna keep on going, but you still want this thing to happen, there's a way to do it, which is to put it in a task. If you put it in the task, that thing I said at the start, then it can go off and run. And even if the first thing you do in that task is await something, you're not blocking your function, you're blocking that closure that you pass to task. That's a different thing, it's a closure, you pass it, it's blocking, not you. So you get to keep running to completion in your actor. 
So that's the way you can do this without suspending. And this is one of the primary things we use tasks for is to fork off some long running thing and we get to keep going. What about closures? I said that if you call a, something that's async, you have to say await. And then uh, when you say wait, you have become async, right? Because you can suspend now. So you have to mark yourself as async. But how do you mark a closure async? Okay, you can't. Right? A closure, you pass as an argument. And so this is a restriction on closures. Closures can only have suspending things. They can only be async when they are passed to a function that marks its closure argument as async. In other words, functions that take closures that are able to suspend themselves have to say that they know how to do that, that they're willing to have that thing be suspended. And you can see why this is too. What if you're passing it to some UI thing? You don't want the UI to get blocked because you pass some closure that has a suspension in it, okay? So the UI would have to know that's happening. And in fact, there are some view modifiers that take async closures. Here's a couple of good examples. One is called task. This is a fantastic view modifier. What this does is it takes a closure, an async closure. So that closure can have suspensions in it. In other words, it's awaiting things like going out on the network, doing whatever terrible slow things. And it starts that task off in a task thing, right? It says task closure, it sends the thing over there. And the, what's cool about this is that that task only lives as long as the view lives. As soon as the view goes away, it cancels that task for you. That's really great. If you have a view, it shows an image, it needs to go load that image. The view appears, it has a task view modifier. The closure goes on the network, loads this slow image. It finally arrives, it puts it up and puts it in the view. But if the view comes on screen and it does that and then the view goes away because the user swipes or something like that, then it cancels that task. So it doesn't waste its time doing that thing anymore. Another one, dot refreshable, pretty cool view modifier. You've seen when you swipe or kind of pull down on a list, it puts a little spinning wheel at the top and reloads the data, all right? You do that so trivially, you just say refreshable, and then you give it a closure that reloads the data. Well, reloading the data might wanna go out in the network or who knows what it's doing, so you want that to be async. So that's an async closure. But you see how these prototypes of these functions says async, closure in the argument. All right, the main actor. This is really where the rubber meets the road here because the most important data structure that we want to protect with multi-threading is the UI. The UI is this massive data structure, all those views and all their vars and a huge data structure. We got to protect that against multi-threading. So very simple. It's just all the stuff in the UI happens on one actor. It's called the main actor. And this thing is the actor that all UI activity has to happen on. I mean, all of it. There's no exception to it. And if you try to do some code that affects the UI in any way off of the main actor, you will get in your Xcode purple runtime errors. You know, this code got executed off the main actor. And if you see that purple, your app is not gonna work. It might seem like it's working, like maybe it works while you're debugging, but you ship it to customers and they're gonna start reporting weird bugs. Like, well, it's, I, something strange happened on my screen. Never ever have those purple errors. Now, all of your view functions, right? The functions inside your views, those are all automatically done on the main actor. So no worries there. But you gotta be careful if you were to do task closure and in there you did it, now you're off the main actor. So be careful there. Your view model, unfortunately, is not run on the main actor. So if you have code in your view model that does something that causes the UI to change, eh, that's gonna cause a problem. Luckily, you can just put at sign main actor right at the top, right before you say class, whatever my view model class is, and it will now make all the code in your view model run on the main actor. Or if you don't need to do that much granularity, you can mark individual functions in your view model with at sign main actor. We'll see this in the demo because we're gonna have a function in our view model that uh, it needs to be sure that it runs on the main actor. Now, error handling, why do I talk about error handling like right as I'm talking about async? Well, async and error handling go together really, really well. And why is this? Well, if I'm sitting waiting, awaiting an async function to do what it does, and it has some problem, like a network error or something like that. Well, it's gonna throw that error, and then immediately we're eligible to be unsuspended. 
So it's a great way for async functions to say, oh, I can't do what this person wanted, I give up, and then instantly have those people awaiting be ready to start going as soon as their actor got time for them to, to continue. Uh, and uh, plus all the other good things about error handling just makes our code look nice so we don't have to be returning error codes and all that stuff. We throw them and then we can handle them and catch them at whatever level we want to do. One thing that you've already noticed, I'm sure, about error handling is syntactically, it feels a lot like multi-threading or asynchronous programming, right? Okay, you got functions that can suspend or marked async, functions that can throw or mark throws. You have to call async functions with await. You have to call throwing functions with try. A similar kind of thing. And when you're using them together so much, they really fit nicely side by side. You have a lot of code that says, try await this. That's a very common thing to say, try await this. And you have a lot of functions that are marked async throws, because they do both. All right, let's look at how you throw an error. So far, the only time we ever had a function that throws was something that was calling something that might throw and it was just rethrowing it. Remember back when we were doing our emoji art persistence? Well, what if I actually wanted to throw my own error that I made up? Here is a function called attend lecture. And if I slept in, then I'm gonna throw this error, CS193P error, missed lecture. Throw it out of there. Now, if I do that, look at the next line of code, ask questions. You don't get to ask any questions, you missed lecture. So when you throw that missed lecture, it bails out of there and does not continue with this function. So that's a great feature of it. Now this CS193P error.miss lecture, it can be an enum or a struct, usually they're enums, and it just has to implement the error protocol. That's the only requirement on it. And that just means this one var here, localized description. You don't actually have to provide a localized description, but you have to mark yourself as a colon error like this. You can have as many cases as you want. In the demo, I'm only gonna have one case, so it's not much of an enum, but you'll get the idea of how it works here. And that's it, that's how you throw your own error. Now what about catching these special errors? And how do you look at an error? So far, when we caught an error, if you look at the do catch right here, we've only had this bottom green version where we just said catch or catch let error, right? And that catches all the errors that weren't caught up till now. But do catch can actually have multiple catches. You see how I have multiple catches here? So in the blue one, I'm catching specifically the CS193P error late homework, and I'm getting its associated value, right? It's an enum, it's got associated value days late. I'm getting it, I'm handling that specifically in here. And in the purple one, I'm catching all other CS193P errors. So I'm saying catch, and then I'm letting the error be assigned to a little variable here, CS193P error, that's just a local variable, where that variable is a CS193P error. Is is a new keyword in Swift that you haven't seen before that checks to see if a variable is of a certain type. So I'm just checking to see if this CS193P error that I just caught here, and I check to make sure that it is an error, and if so, I'm gonna handle it. Otherwise, just keep on going to the next catch. And then the green one will catch all non-CS193P errors because the purple one's gonna catch all the ones that are CS193P errors. Now, you see down here, the print keep going. I put this down here to remind you that after you catch the error, it's gonna continue down here. So it's kind of the opposite of the thrower, right? When the thrower throws, the rest of his function doesn't get executed. When the catcher catches, the rest of their function does get implemented. All right, background image fetching. So let's talk about how I'm going to do this conceptually. I'm gonna use a state machine. How many people have actually written code that uses a state machine? Well, not too many, interesting. Okay, so the idea of state machine programming is I'm going to think about all the states that I can be in as I go and do some process, and I'm going to actually code them, make notations in my code somehow for each of those steps. And a great data type for uh, state machines is an enum because by definition you're moving through the states, they're distinct states, and so enums are distinct states. So here is what my state machine is. I'm gonna go, let's put this, put it right here. I'm gonna put all of this code actually in its own thing here, background image handling. I an enum, I'm gonna call it my background. And what are the states? 
of fetching something. Well, you could be like in the none state, you're doing nothing. No, no background thing has been dragged and dropped in. You're just nowhere. Maybe I'm out there fetching it. So I might have the case fetching. But while I'm fetching, I probably want to know the URL that I'm fetching. So I'll put a little associated data there uh, for my URL. Then I fetch that URL and either it comes back and I've got the image or it fails, some a network failure or something. So I really have two cases in my state machine there. I could found the image, in which case I'll just hold on to the UI image I found, or I could failed, right, thing failed, in which case I could keep the error, right, the error that I got. I'm just going to keep a string just to make it simple, a string that described probably the localized description of the error that I got. So this is my state machine's states. And I'm just going to kind of go through this state machine step by step and do all the steps that are involved. Now, since I have this nice little state machine enum, I also created some little convenience functions here. I call them my background convenience functions. So let's take a look at these. These are little vars that all they do is they return the associated data of a certain state in my background if I'm in that state. So you see UI image, it's switching on myself. And if I'm in the found state, it's returning the image. Otherwise, it just returns nil. You got that? And now I'm doing the same thing with the URL being fetched. I'm switching on myself. And if I'm fetching, I'll return my URL. And I'm doing down here with the failure reason. Same thing. If I am in the failed state, give me my failure reason. And these are just convenience. So I can just say, what's my background UI image right now? And it'll just be nil if I don't have, if I'm not in the state where I found one. If I'm in any other state, none or fetching or whatever, it'll just be nil. And then I put a nice little bool in here. Am I fetching? Is fetching? And that's just, if my URL being fetched is not nil, then I'm clearly fetching. Because when I'm in the fetching state, the dot fetching up here, I have a URL, but that's the only time I have a URL. All right, now that I have this nice little state thing, what I'm gonna do is get rid of this as my background. I'll comment it out so that you remember it was there. And instead, I'm gonna create a little at sign published var, which I'm gonna call my background. And now it's gonna be of type background. And I'll start it out in the none state. And I'm making it publish because this is how my UI is gonna see the background. And it's gonna be able to see what state I'm in at all times because look, I'm giving it that enum. And it could even use the convenience functions, for example. So as long as I properly progress through these states as the URL is changing in my emoji art, then my UI should be able to see all kinds of stuff. Am I in the middle of fetching? That's the is fetching thing. How, do I have an image to show? Did I get an error? It can even put up an alert with an error because it can see where we are. All right, let's in fact go do that just to see what I mean by that. Here we are in my view. Here's async image. Remember we had this phase stuff here and the phase stuff is kind of like doing this. This phase is an enum. It's kind of going through the phases. It doesn't really let you look at it whenever you want. So we're gonna get rid of our async image entirely and replace it with our thing. Now, how would our thing work? I'm just gonna say, if I can let UI image equal my documents backgrounds UI image, which that's only gonna be non-nil when I'm in the found an image state of my state machine, right? Which is my state machine. Only if I've found an image is my UI image gonna be non-nil. So I have an image to display. Fine, I'll display it. Image, UI, image of that UI image. And I want it positioned the exact same as the async image was. That's it. Look how simple my UI code is. No errors. And why is this so easy here? Well, because I picked a good abstraction for my searching for this image and my UI is just gonna watch it. And since it's published, this background is published, as soon as UI image appears, it's gonna show it. All right, now we have to go into our view model here and make this state machine go. We have to make it step through these states. But where does it start? It starts, somebody sets a URL of our background image. As soon as someone sets our background image, we got to start going fetching it. So where can we find out that that's happened? Well, there's a really cool place to do it right here. This is our emoji art, our model. 
And we're already doing something when it changes, which is we're auto-saving it. Now we're just gonna do another thing when it changes, which we're gonna see if the background has changed. And if it is, we're gonna start fetching. Very simple, I'm just gonna say, if my emoji art background does not equal the old values background, in other words, this is happening when emoji art changes, I'm now saying, and I specifically am interested in when the background changes, what am I gonna do here? Well, let's just have a function fetch background image. And this is going to run our state machine. That's what fetch background image is gonna do. Let's go down here inside our nice little background image area at the top and have our private func fetch background image. And you guys know how I like to program. I like to just type it in like it would just work and then go fix all the problems. Because when I just type it in, then I get an idea at least what I'm looking for. I might be all wrong and it might just won't work that way, but at least I can just type it in how I want. So here's what I want. If their URL exists, so if the emoji art has the ba a background, then I want to start out my state machine by saying that I'm fetching that URL, the emoji arts background, right? Which is that, what that URL is. And then I want to move on to the next level, which is I found it, hopefully. And how am I going to set the UI image that I found? I'm going to need a function for that. So I'll just call it fetch UI image from URL. Or it might have failed, in which case I want to go background.failed with some error message of some sort, the proper error message. And if URL is nil, then my background thing is back to none. So you see how this moves me through my state machine? I obviously have a problem here. I don't have any such thing, fetch UI image, so I need to do that. And maybe we'll have some other changes as we go, but let's go ahead and do that thing. Private func fetch UI image from some URL, and it's gonna return a UI image. What does this function look like? Well, I need to get the data out of that URL. Hopefully it's like a JPEG or a PNG or a TIFF file or something. Get that data out and create a UI image from it. Remember I told you that UI image is the thing we do to kind of hold on to an image in our hand. Let's do that. We actually know how to get the data from the URL. We did it before, which is, data equals data contents of URL. Remember that function that we had? And then maybe I could just say, return a UI image with that data. So this is an idea. It's not a very good idea, but it's an idea. And what's the problem with this thing? It's not these errors. It's that this is not an async function, so it blocks. So if I call this right here, it is going to block my application. So while I'm out there fetching, it's gonna be sitting there, not responding to touches, no swipes, no nothing, it's just stuck, because it is blocked right here. And a data contents of URL, it works for HTTP URLs, but it's not really intended to be used for that. It's for file URLs, where you won't block. Right? A file URL, you just, it maps the file, so you're gonna get it really quick. So that is not what we want to use. Luckily, of course, there is something we can use to get this data, which is a URL session. The URL session is a struct that has all kinds of mechanism for downloading stuff from a URL. And it's really sophisticated and powerful, but it has a nice shared, global shared one that we can use so that we don't have, to, we can build one and it has some configuration stuff, but it has this shared one that has all the most common configurations. And one of the functions that is in a URL session is data from URL. Async call in a function that does not support concurrency. So this is async. It's marked async. It knows how to do the whole suspension game and all that. That's exactly what we want here. And we're going to get to how we do that in a second. Now I have another problem here, which is, uh, it says cannot convert value of type data comma URL response to type data. Well, this URL session share doesn't actually return just the data. It also, in a tuple, returns the URL response you got. 
So when you make an HTTP request, you get some information back about what happened with that request, not just the data that was in the file you asked for, but some info. Now we don't need any of that. So I'm actually gonna underbar that to just get that out of my way. Cause all I want is the actual data, I'm not doing any kind of HTTP specific stuff there. Now, another problem we got down here, value of optional type UI image must be unwrapped. Ooh, interesting. Well, we're gonna punt on that for the moment. I'm just gonna force unwrap it to make that error go away. But we are gonna have to deal with that fact because this UI image data data returns nil whenever it couldn't see a JPEG file in there or not TIFF or PNG, it's not, I can't get an image. Now UI image is really good at looking at raw data and figuring out, is that a JPEG file? Oh, what is that in there? But if it can't figure it out, it returns nil. Okay, this is what's called a failable initializer. Hopefully you remember reading that from your reading, but it's just a, a initializer that can return nil if it can't do what you're asking. So we'll have to fix that in a second, but for now we'll just force unwrap it and crash our app if we try to drag and drop some random URL in. All right, but before we do that, let's focus on this async business. So what do we have to do when we call an async function like URL session .share .data from URL? We have to mark it await. Every time you cannot call a function like this without saying await, which means I want to await the answer that comes back from doing this possibly long running thing. Now it also says here, that this call can throw, but it's not marked with try. So URL session share data could also throw, network unavailable, for example, right? Or no such URL out there. So we also wanna make this to be try. And so you can see this try await, I told you it's common and it is, you're gonna see this all the time, this try await. The other thing it's saying here is that this async call is in a function that does not support concurrency. And that's because if we can suspend here on this line, which we can, because we said await, if you say await, you can suspend there, you have to mark yourself as a function that can suspend, and you do that with async. But now it's saying errors thrown from here are not handled. And we're used to seeing this, we tried something, how do we handle it? We could do catch it, but what I'm gonna do is rethrow it here. I'm gonna rethrow it back up because I actually want my state machine to see that error and update into the failed state. So I'm gonna say async throws. Now, since we're throwing already from this function, let's throw an error if that UI image comes back nil. See that UI image that we're returning? Let's go here and say, if I can let UI image equal that, then I will return it. Otherwise, I'm gonna throw an error. And what error am I gonna throw? I can make up anything I want. I'll say a fetch error. I'm gonna make mine be an enum. So fetch error dot bad image data, because that's what that was. You made me go out in that URL and get that data and it wasn't an image. I couldn't make a UI image out of it. So I'll just make a little enum here called fetch error and it has to be an error protocol. In the case, bad image data. Now I could have associated data here if I wanted. I don't need any, but I'm allowed to have associated data just like I had back in the CS193P error case, right? If you were late homework, it was how many days late. I could have that here. And I could obviously have more cases but I really only have this one error that I'm gonna deal with here. And look, no errors there in that fetch UI image. It's perfectly fine to just say, else throw this error if I get this error. But the problem here now is we have fetch UI image, it's async throws. We're just bumping the problem up a level to here. Cause now this is saying, wait, you're making an async call in a function that doesn't support concurrency. This one right here, fetch background image. Well, I'm gonna fix that one by also marking myself async and just saying await this. I could put await before any function call, perfectly reasonable, even a function call that I'm using to set the associated value of an enum, fine, it's just a function call. And now we got another one here, call can throw, 
but is not marked with try, which we know that fetch UI image, look at that, async throws, it can throw. Now here I'm not going to rethrow. I'm going to handle errors now because look, I'm in my state machine. The very next line is background equals dot failed. Woohoo, perfect time to catch that error and set my state machine state to be the failed state. Very simple. I'm just going to around this call, do what it is. Catch. Put a do catch around that. And inside the catch, I'm going to say this background failed. And instead of just saying error message, how about something like couldn't set background. And let's go ahead and give them the errors localized description so they can see what the error was. And again, remember, this is the same as let error. So this variable here is this variable here, but this is the common case. So Swift lets you just leave that off. And of course, if I'm gonna call a function that can throw, I have to mark it as try. All problem solved. We marked ourselves as async so we could await something. We can be suspended there which makes sense that we could be suspended there. We're way fetching an image and we are handling our errors. So we're almost done here. And look how close this function ended up to being the state machine I just typed it in. It was almost exactly right. It, I just had to put the do catch in there. That's really the only thing that was different. And this is the power of this, the way they've done this async program is it kind of just all flows how you would normally flow it. And you just have to make sure you understand that you might be suspended. Now, the fact that we can be suspended there is gonna cause a problem, possibly, and I'll get back to that. But so far it looks good, no errors except, oh, up here, eh, this is a problem. Because this is now an async function, fetch background image, of course, because it can suspend. What do we do here? Well, of course, we have to say await, because we're calling an async function. And this is now going to say, wait a second, I understand, await, great, except you're still calling it in a context that's not concurrent because this is not in an async function. Yikes, what are we going to do here? This is a did set of a property observer. <laughs> Where do I put the async? We need to fork this off and let it be done somewhere else. So this is a classic place where we say, I can't be async here, so I'm going to fork this off. Task closure, and I'm never going to cancel it or whatever. You could imagine some day down the road, we might want to be able to cancel. Like we start fetching something, it takes a really long time and we give up on it. Maybe we want to cancel, but eh, for now, we'll just fork it off. The closure that you give task is by definition an async function. So you can do a wait in there. This should just work because we have no errors. Everything, the state machine is fully specified through all four of its states. Let's see what happens when we run here. It worked because I took out async image and put our thing in. It worked, it loaded it, there it is right there. It seems like everything's working fine. Let's go back and look what's happening over here. Uh-oh. Now, if you looked at this, you'd be like, oh yeah, everything's fine. But look at the top, at the very top, purple triangle of death. Do you see the little purple triangle that says one? Let's click on that. Uh oh, publishing changes from background threads is not allowed. Uh, and it's even showing us this line right here. I'm setting my background to found with the result of this. That's causing my UI to redraw. You see why? Because I have this code over here in my UI that says, when this gets published, draw this image. So it worked. And I might think, oh, my program's fine. I'll ignore this purple thing. It drew the background, but don't. So how do we fix this? We can't have purple errors. Well, that's this main actor thing I was talking about. Just like you were saying over there, this stuff that I forked off on a different task, it's not running on the main actor and it's happening at the same time. Now I can fix this in a couple of ways. One way I could do it is I could make my entire view model always do all of its stuff on the main actor. If I do this and run, and then all functions and bars in the view model are running on the main actor, it reloads it, no purple. You'll notice the purple ones a lot if you have your navigator open, but if you don't, the only indication you get is that little triangle up there. So keep an eye out for that. 
So that's a fix. It's a little bit of a blunt force fix to make our entire view model do that. Really the only function down here that has this problem is this one right here. This is the only one that actually does any code that has this problem, right? That's changing the UI. This one down here doesn't. You see this one down here, fetch image, UI image. It does something that looks like it might be a UI thing, this UI image, but this does not actually change our UI. It just creates a UI image. It's not putting it in the UI or anything, just creating it. It's all doing and returning it. So it doesn't need to be on the main actor. Now, how does this kind of work to just mark this main actor? Well, essentially, we forked off that task up at the top, right? Fetch background image. It calls this. And as soon as it wants to execute a line of code in this function, it switches over to the main actor's thread. Because it's not allowed to execute any lines of code inside here off the main actor. Now, it might have to wait, by the way, because the main actor might be busy. User swiping or tapping or doing something else. And that's fine. That's one of the great things about this actor system is things want an actor and they can't get it. They're suspended. Or they have to wait. And it's fine. They just wait. It's just kind of keeping a queue and just always feeding the next one. And of course, we know tasks have priority, so it kind of knows which one is most important to go next. And it's doing all behind the scenes. And it makes this really simple to, to get this stuff working. Now, this seems like we're expert multi-threaded programmers here, right? We got this right and everything is just good, but there's actually quite a possible problem here. And let me describe this scenario to you. I go to my emoji art. I drag in an image from a very slow website and it's taken a long time. I'm like, ah, forget it. I'll just use a different image. And I drag an image from a very fast website. Whoop, bam, bam, it appears. What's gonna happen a few seconds later? The other one's gonna come in and, you, and blast my background. Okay, because both of them were forked off to go do it. And while I was waiting for the long time taking one, the quick one came in and did it. But then when the long one came in here, when this finally returned fetch UI image, I didn't check to see if the user had chosen something else. So this is what I'm saying. Every time you call a wait, you wanna say, when this comes back, is there anything that might have changed in my world? And what might have changed here is the user dragged some other URL in. So I have to protect against that here. Let image equal this same exact thing. Then I'll say found image here. But I'm going to have to check before I set this image. I'm going to say if the URL that I went and fetched, that's this URL right here, equals the background, then I'll set my state machine to that. I'm just double checking here to make sure that in the meantime, the user didn't choose a different background for their emoji art. This is a great example of what I'm talking about. Every time you're having a wait, go look at the code after it and make sure, okay, yeah, that's right. Because multi-threaded programming, Swift has absolved us of a lot of the having to deal with things, but it's still not absolved us of the semantic problem of doing things, multiple threads. We still have to think for our program what that means. Now that we have this great engine, this state machine, we can do some other cool features. For example, remember in the async image, I had the little spinning wheel show up. That didn't reliably actually do the right thing, but we can do exactly the right thing here because we know from our state machine when we're fetching. We always know when we're in this state of fetching. In fact, I even put a little is fetching down here to denote that. So let's go back to our UI and up here, I'm gonna say, if my document's background is fetching, then put a progress view here, please. This is actually a little better than we had before because before our async image was down here at the bottom in our document contents, and that meant it got scaled. We don't want our progress view, the spinning thing, to get scaled. If we happen to be zoomed way in, with our gigantic progress view, so, this is really more accurate to be handling this outside of that. If we did want to scale it, like if we wanted it to be, let's say, twice as big as it usually is, and maybe we want to put some tint on it, some blue on there or something, we can do that. 
The other thing about our progress view is we want it to be in the middle, right, right in the center. We know how to do that. That is just dot position, emoji dot position dot zero in our geometry. Let's see what this looks like. Go back to this image. I think this is a pretty big image right here. Hopefully we'll get a little progress view. Yeah. Tinted, scaled up, twice the size of normal. That was cool. What else can we do? How about an error? Right now we have terrible error handling where we put the URL on the screen. What we really want is an alert. And this is a great chance to learn how to do alerts too. So let's, how do we put up an alert that says, ah, couldn't load that thing. We're gonna do that by having a little on change up here. Let's do this, on change of the documents, backgrounds, failure reason. Remember, that's the little thing I put on there. It's only non-nil when we actually have a failure. Then I need to put up an alert. And putting up an alert is similar to putting up a sheet or a pop over. We need a bool to do it. And I'm gonna say, show the background failure alert equals true. Of course, we need an add sign state, private var, this thing. starts out being false. And then when that's true, how do we make the thing go up? Now, we could put a sheet up and design something that looks just like an alert, but of course there's a built-in thing for doing alerts. It's called dot alert. You attach it just like a sheet or something. Alert. Let's do the one that has all the arguments here and I will spread them out so we can see them clearly. So here's an alert. Again, kind of like sheet or popover, but it's obviously got some extra arguments here. The first argument, title key, is the title that's going to show up on the top of the alert. By the way, the alert is going to look like all the alerts you've ever seen on an iPhone, right? A little gray box, center of the screen, OK, cancel at the, at the bottom, that whole deal. So the title here, this alert, when are we putting it up? We're putting it up when someone's trying to set the background. So I'm going to have the title be set background. So the person knows, yeah, I know you're setting a background. I have an alert for you. The second thing is, is presented just like the other ones. This is a binding to that bool. So dollar sign, show background failure alert. Presenting is a very interesting argument. This is semantically, what is it you are presenting here? And what are we presenting with this alert? We're presenting the failure. Right? We're presenting that reason that things failed. So when we say, what are we presenting here? I notice it's a T question mark. It's a don't care. It can be anything we want. Has to be an optional though. How about document dot background dot failure reason? That is what we're presenting in this alert. We are presenting to. Now that's not all the alert can say, but that is semantically, fundamentally what we're presenting here. Now the next thing, actions, is what buttons are on this alert? Okay, cancel, whatever. We just want one, which is an okay button. So I'm gonna go here to actions. But what's really cool about actions is it gives us this, whatever thing we're presenting, back to us. And what's nice about it is it's not an optional here. Here, document uh, background of fail reason, that has to be an optional because if you're presenting nil, it won't put the alert up or at least it's not supposed to. It seems to me like it actually does. The documentation says if this is nil, won't put the alert up, but I've tried it, it does. But anyway, this is an optional, it has to be an optional. This will be the same thing, but not optional because presumably you're actually showing it, so you would, it wouldn't be up there. And inside here, I'm just gonna say make a button. I only need an okay button. And I'm actually gonna make this thing be a cancel button. I'll show you why in a second. And the button, when I click OK, it does nothing. There's no action need to be taken. It's just going to put the alert away. Well, no matter what buttons you put here, when you click one of them, it dismisses the alert. So you don't have to explicitly set show background failure alert to false or something. The alert does that for you. Why did I put roll cancel there? Remember, I don't know if you we didn't really dwell on this, but there was role destructive. Remember on that other one, it came in red. Well, another role is cancel. I recommend if you just have one button uh, in your alert, that it's basically a cancel button. It's basically make this go away. 
And the uh, cancel button looks slightly different. It's a little like a little bolder text. Uh, and I just think it's kind of good strategy to do it. Now I could list multiple buttons here. I could have okay and cancel. So I could have this one be cancel and not have the role cancel on this one and have two buttons, but I don't need an okay to cancel because I'm not asking them to do anything. I'm just telling them something happened. And of course, if I had okay and cancel, maybe in the closure for the okay button, I'm doing something and in the cancel one, then I'm not doing anything, right? Full flexibility to do what you want to do there. And then the last thing, message, that's the view that's going to be displayed at the top of the alert. Normally a text with the text alert, but it's a view, so you can put anything you want there. And it also gets past that reason back to you. So if I go down here, to closure, I get that reason back again. And this time I am going to use the reason. I'm going to say text of the reason. So I'm just going to put the reason in the alert as a text. But I could do much more here. This is a view builder. Do anything we want. Ooh, we have an error. We always set this thing to true, no matter what the reason is. When the reason is nil, then we want this to be false. So this needs to be reason does not equal nil. Put in parentheses if you want. Let's take a look at this. We get our error one first. Set background. It says couldn't set background. The resource cannot be loaded because the app transport security policy requires the use of a secure connection which is true. This app does not allow it non-secure HTTP. Back here, let's get our good one. Woohoo! Another thing we could do is when we drag in an image, what if we sized our entire document to fit that image? So we drag a small image, it'll zoom it out. We drag a big image, it'll zoom in a little bit. Easy to do. Another on change of, I'm gonna say on change of our documents background image, some zoom to fit function that I'm gonna to have to provide. Take the UI images size in our geometry. So zoom to that size, let's add zoom to fit. I have it down here, I'm do that fast because we're running out of time. Here's my zoom to fit code that I just typed in really, really, really fast. This zoom to fit, there's one that zooms to fit a size and one that zooms to fit a rect here, right? One calls the other. All I'm doing here is looking at my geometry size and the size of the rectangle that I'm zooming to, picking whichever one is the smaller zoom and then setting my zoom and pan. You can go look, you don't have to understand that all right now. It's only a few lines of code. So you look at it later, but it's just setting my zoom and pan to zoom in on that thing. Let's see this in action. Again, we were able to do this with one line of code there, that on change of, because we have these primitives, and there it did it, actually. You see? It loaded up this document. It zoomed it exactly to fit that. Let's go find another one here, this little guy. See? Zoomed him out. How about double tap to zoom? What if we double tap to include all emojis and the backgrounds, right? Zoom to just barely fit it. How about that one? That'd be a fun one. That's easy. Up here with a double tap gesture, dot on tap gesture. Count of two, that's a double tap. And there, we'll just do zoom to fit there as well. Zoom to fit. But this one is, I need to basically fit a documents B box, bounding box in my geometry. I don't have a B box var for my, for my view model, but I could add it. Let's go over here, put it yeah, up here where we get our emojis. I think I have a B box here for my document. And there it is, there's a little B box function. I'm just going through each of the emojis and unioning its B box with starting out at zero, and then also unioning in the background size so we need emoji B box as well. So let's go down here. We'll add that as a nice extension, just like we add font, B box emoji. There it is. And it's just the B box of a certain emoji. It's just a rectangle. It's centered on the position 
But the B box is presented in the position of nil, no geometry. So if I'm gonna allow no geometry, that means I have to make this be question mark, which is no problem. I'll just make this geometry.frame here be question mark. And if it's nil, then zero as my center. Because here I'm trying to get the kind of absolute B box of all these things so that I can zoom it to the, and fit it to the middle. So I don't really need to use a geometry of any particular view to get this behavior here. Let's run and see if that works. All right, let's make it small and then double tap. Ooh, it works. And let's put maybe some emoji off here to the side and scroll around so it's not there. Double tap. Oh, zooms in to include it as well. It might have been in here working on this. Double tap. Shows me all my emojis. So that way, if I have emojis off to the side, I can find them all. All these things that we were able to do here, like these, this on tap gesture and the error and zooming to fit a new UI and putting the alert, are all because we had that nice little state machine that we predictably knew where we always were in loading that image. All right, your assignment six is due in two days. I've seen most of you very active on the forums, so I know you're all working on that, so that's good. Right after that, you're gonna start on your final project. So next Wednesday, I'll see you back here, and we'll turn emoji art into a multi-document app.